All right, hello. Today's the 17th, uh, Saturday after Pentecost. Um, I missed yesterday. I went out to dinner with my mom and a couple of my cousins and met them in Forsyth for some Cracker Barrel. It was nice. Caught up. It's a nice visit. But um, I missed, didn't have time to do yesterday's reading. So I'm going to do yesterday's reading and I'll post that and then I'll do today's reading. So 17th Friday after Pentecost, we're reading from the Bible and Holy Fathers for Orthodox Christians. That's published by St. Vladimir's Press. It's out of print right now. I only post one or one or two at a time and then hide the other old ones. Okay, so Ephesians 4, 17 through 25. It's really small print, so I gotta use a paper here. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardening of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to licentiousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God, in righteousness and true holiness. Therefore, putting away lying, each one speak truth to his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man created according to God. This is the homily by St. John Chrysostom on this. How then is the renewal to take place? In the spirit of, the, of your mind, he says. Whosoever therefore has the spirit will perform no old deed, but the spirit will not endure old deeds. In the spirit of your mind, he says, that is, in the spirit which is your mind, in your mind, do you see that the subject is one, but the clothing is twofold, that which is put off and that which is put on? Now, why does he call virtue a man? And why vice a man? Because a man cannot be shown without acting, so that these things no less than nature, show a man whether he is good or evil. The young man is strong, therefore let us also become strong for the performance of good actions. The young man has no wrinkle, therefore neither should we have. The young man does not waver, nor does he easily take, is he easily taken with diseases, therefore neither should we be. Observe here how he calls this realizing of virtue this bringing of it into being from nothing, a creation. But was not that other former creation after God? No, in no wise, but after the devil. He is the sole creator of sin. There was of old a righteousness. There was a likeness, excuse me, there was likewise a holiness with the Jews. Yet that was not righteousness in truth, but in figure. For being clean in body was a type of purity, not in truth of purity. It was a type of righteousness, not the truth of righteousness. For there are many who, to those that are outside, seem to be righteous, yet they are false. For listen to Christ how he says, Unless your righteousness will exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5.20 if, therefore, we will be able to appear righteous one towards another before the terrible tribunal, we may meet with some loving kindness. Toward God, indeed, it is impossible we should appear so, whatever we may have to show. But if we do not violate what is righteous towards each other, then we will be righteous. If we will be able to show that we have been treated unrighteously, then we will be righteous. How does he say to those who are already clothed, put on? He is now speaking about clothing which is from life and good works. 
before the clothing was from baptism, whereas now it is from the daily life and from works. But what does the word holy mean? It is that which is pure, that which is proper. Our part, then, is never to put off the garment of righteousness. This the prophet also calls the garment of salvation, Isaiah 61.10. So he may be made like God. We should never delay at all. For hear the prophet when he says, He clothed himself also with cursing as with a garment, and it came into his inward parts, Psalms 109.18. And again, who covers thyself with light as with a garment? Psalms 104.2. St. John Chrysostom, homily 13 on Ephesians 4, book 57, pages 114 through 115. So he's pointing out that there are, there are two garments we put on. We, we, can, we, we choose which one. And, you know, if we, if we stay with the old man, then we're of this world and we're going to commit evil acts and follow our desires and our lusts and our passions and do whatever we want to do. That's of the devil. We're going to, we're going to end up dying. We're killing ourselves. If we put on Christ and we put on the new man, Christ Jesus, and we put our selves our will and our desires to death, uh, pick up our cross and put our desires to death and follow after Christ, we put on the new man and we purify ourselves and it's a constant battle um, till, till we die. Then we can have hope for heaven. But it's not something that you can ever get comfortable with. When you're on the cross, you, you're not comfortable. There's no way to get comfortable if you try to pull up with your arms, you hurt your arms. If you try to push up with your feet, you're hurting your feet. No matter what you do, you can't get comfortable. Well, it's the same thing with being an Orthodox Christian in this life. Um, no matter what you do, you're going to suffer. And that's true even if you're not a Christian. But as a Christian, it's pretty, pretty continuous. Um, but there is joy to be had. Don't get me wrong. There's joyful sorrow. You still have peace in your heart and love for your neighbor. Not that you won't ever be tempted. You know, you, there are times when you aren't peaceful, and but those are your weaknesses. But you constantly pick yourself up and you keep trying. Fall down, you get up. Fall down, and get up until you you can't do it anymore and you die. That's it. So he's pointing that out, and he's pointing out when you're baptized, you're given the grace of God, and it purifies you, and you may go for a time without any sin because of the remission of sins that comes from baptism. But after you've been baptized for a while, you start to notice that you, you have to follow through to keep that going. So you have to work at it. And it comes from your actions. You can't just profess to be a Christian and tell people what Christianity is. You have to live it. And it's not easy, and you're going to fall down and get up repeatedly. And I've done that horribly. So redirect. That's what I keep doing. I keep redirecting, and that's why I'm doing this. Me spending time doing this is better than me spending time watching TV or doing something else. It's not edifying. So, And I get on here and ask for people to pray for me, which I need. <laughs> All right, so back to the book. Mark 12. They began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a place for the vine or the wine vat, and built a tower. And he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. At the vintage time, he sent a servant to the vine dressers that he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard from the vine dressers. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty handed. Again, he sent them another servant, and at him they threw stones, wounded him in the head, and sent him away shamefully treated. And again, he sent another, and him they killed and many others, beating some and killing some. Therefore, still having one son he, be he beloved, he also sent him to them last, saying, They will respect my son. But those vine dressers said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, for the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. 
And they sought to lay hold of him, but feared the multitude, for they knew he had spoken the parable against them. So they left him and went away. Okay, so the 13th Sunday after Pentecost is where the commentary is at. Let me find that real quick. So this is St. John Chrysostom again. He says, He intimates many things by this parable. He's talking about Jesus. God's providence, which had been exercised toward them from the first, their murderous disposition from the beginning, that nothing had been omitted of whatever pertained to a needful care of them, that even when the prophets had been slain, he had not turned away from them, but had sent his very son, that the God both of the New and of the Old Testament was one and the same, that his death would effect great blessings, that they were to endure extreme punishment for the crucifixion and their crime the calling of the Gentiles, the casting out of the Jews. And observe also both his great care and the excessive idleness of those men, of these men. For the things that pertain to the husbandmen, he did himself. He left little for them to do, to take care of what was there and to preserve what was given to them. For nothing was left undone, but all accomplished. And he sent his servants, that is, the prophets, to receive the fruit that is, their obedience, the proof of it, by their works. And where do they take counsel to kill him? Out of the vineyard. Do you see how he prophesies even the place where he was to be slain, and they cast him out and slew him? St. John Chrysostom, homily 68 on Matthew 21, 1 and 2, book 54, pages 414 to 415. So, yeah, it's all pretty self-explanatory. St. John Chrysostom does it better than I can. You get the idea. The Old and the New Testament are the same God. Nothing's changed. It's just that people are given more understanding and more opportunities. And you can't experience the remission of sins without baptism. And then after baptism, you have to spend your whole life trying to maintain it. And you're going to get tempted constantly. You're going to fall down and get up, fall down and get up, till you learn to quit falling down, just like a baby learns to walk. It's the same thing for a Christian. And uh, sometimes kids are handicapped. Sometimes they don't survive. You know, these things happen in, in natural life. They also happen in the spiritual life. So it's a real, this life is a struggle. It's a contest. We've got to, we've got to push ourselves and make choices and try to seek after God. We fall down, we get up. And... Um, basically it that's another thing when you repent of your sins you've confessed them you've acknowledged them you've changed your behavior you have to change your behavior too because acting remember he said act your actions matter not just your words the devil's an accuser he will keep trying to accuse you don't listen just redirect go back to living it and reading the scriptures and the saints um, people will do the same thing They'll bring up old things that happen and they'll keep throwing it in your face. And as long as you and the people around you are focused on God and working towards Him together and helping each other get there, that's the way it's supposed to be. When people are not, it falls apart and people get destroyed. Families get destroyed. That's that's what happens. So... It's happened to my family. It's happened to multiple families. So please pray for me, a sinner. God bless. Over and out.